A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God has a question for us. What is the true fast? In the preceding verses of this reading uh, from Isaiah, which were not included in this excerpt, the Lord makes an observation of the people of Israel. You have no problem abstaining from food or whatnot, but in the meantime you sin terribly. You don't seem to care that you oppress and you cheat the workers. You don't care that you're engaged in violence constantly. And you certainly don't keep holy the Sabbath. I'm not impressed, he says. Let me tell you what I want to see when you fast. Remove oppression and support the afflicted. Then what? Well, your light will break forth. Your healing will spring up. Your righteousness will come to you so quickly that it will go right through you and past you. Remove oppression and support the afflicted. Then what? Your light will rise up against the darkness. Your worst day will be the brightest. And the Lord will be with you and satisfy you and enliven you and fill you with blessing until you're so full that you pour out into the lives of all those around you. In short, sow peace and you will reap peace. That's the gist of it. That sounds pretty good, and I want to live that, and I think everybody here wants to live that as well. I really must stop walking along Forest Park Avenue. I started doing this about a month ago just to get away from studies over at AI in between classes to get some fresh air and to just move around a bit. Normally it doesn't take long, I just go down to the gas station and back about 15 minutes. And the first time I did this, this woman stops me on the way back. And she stops me and she asks, are you a priest? And I said, no, I'm just a lowly uh, student brother. And she proceeded to tell me with tears in her eyes of what was going on in her life. She had lost her job, she was looking for work, and her marriage of 30 years was failing. The, The second time I did this, was just this week, this last Tuesday. And the Lord didn't even wait for me to be on the way back. This guy was crossing the street right as I was approaching Forest Park Avenue. I waved to him just to be nice, but all of a sudden we were in sync and we started walking together. And of course he starts talking to me. And he tells me what's going on in his life. 
He says, I'm Bill. Well, I asked him his name. His name is Bill. And Bill was a barge worker on the Missouri River. And he'd lost his job also. He'd been living in a hotel while working. You know, it's probably one of these weekly rates or monthly rates or whatever. That's pretty expensive, very expensive. And now without a job, he was on his way to pick up his stuff from the hotel and get out so that he could find a place in some Christian mission that he'd run into. He wasn't sure what he was going to do. He's 48 years old. He doesn't have any family. Nothing. He's got nothing. All I could do for these people was say something to the effect of, I don't think you're alone, and I'm going to pray for you. That's all I could do. That's it. So when I read passages like this from Isaiah, I want to scream. I have nothing to give. You want me to feed? I don't have any cash. I don't carry food with me. You want me to clothe? They have clothes. They can get clothes anywhere, and they don't want these. It wouldn't fit them anyways. You want, sh- uh, I, 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 I should house them, I should shelter them? I don't have a room of my own. I don't make those kind of decisions. I'm supposed to free them. How am I supposed to do that? I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not a vocational trainer. I don't run a homeless shelter. And I'm so new to this place that I don't even know where to send them. What frustrates me even more is when I read about guys like St. Martin de Porras. Because St. Martin, St. Martin proves that this can be done. That frustrates me. Have you read about what he was able to do in his life? He was able to care for the sick. He was trained as a physician before he even entered the order. He would go and he would beg alms on the street, and he would use that money to go then buy food for the people who needed it. But why didn't he bring it back to the house? Doesn't the province need support? He founded homes for orphans and abandoned children. I wouldn't even know where to begin. And this is not to mention the miracles that surrounded his life, healings, levitation, bilocation, and I believe it. I believe it all, because he's a holy man, and I know that the Lord works through holy men and women that way. Okay, well, maybe I don't buy the story about the mice, but that's, yeah. I'm frustrated because there's a part of me that wants to fulfill this constantly in my life, especially when I run into people like Annette and Bill. And maybe I will someday. I've got a long life ahead of me. I don't know what the Lord wants of me right now. Um, I don't know what opportunities are going to come along. I don't know what the order is going to tell me to do. The future is wide open. But the greater part of me right now knows I can't. That's what gets me. Money? Yeah, I have access to money. It's not my money. If I started spending my whole stipend just to feed people all, all over the place, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I would get a talking to. Strangers? If, if I brought home strangers to put up in our guest rooms, I'm sure, you know, again, I would get a talking to, especially from our prior and our student master. I can't do that, and that would put all of you at risk. I can't do it. Institutions? I, you know, again, I don't know where to begin. Don't, you know, you've got to buy land or get a building permit, and you have to obey the zoning laws and all this sort of stuff, and I, I, I don't know how to do that. Very few of you know how to do that, if any. And anyways, this wasn't the reason I joined. If I felt like that was my main calling, to do that sort of stuff, I would have joined another order. That's not to say we don't do that sort of stuff. I know we do, social justice work and this sort of thing. But that's not normally our ultimate focus. We have the mission of intellectual charity, not necessarily you know, corporal charity and this sort of thing. That's what I felt called to. So how do I fulfill this? And in the meantime, what do I do with this discomfort that I have, with this burdened conscience that is with me always. I can't get away from these people. And even if I wanted to, I mean, I'd see them as we drive by. They're everywhere. Well, let's go back to what the main message of the, uh, of the reading was today. 
Sow peace and you will reap peace. Okay. Um, well, I'm not doing that right now. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe I'll get a ministry site later, I think, uh, second year and so forth. Um, fine. Uh, but, but, but right now, I'm not doing corporal works of mercy. I'm not going forth into the world and preaching the gospel for the salvation of souls. I'm, I'm in my friggin' room always studying or up here and praying or hanging out with you guys. I don't do this. So the uncomfortable question is, do I deserve peace? Should I get peace at this point? Do I deserve to be at peace with myself? And the uncomfortable answer to that is no. I don't. I don't deserve to be at peace. And that's just the truth of it. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of holy anxiety. And I don't want to go too far with this because I know that there's always the risk of scrupulosity and various other neuroses, but holy anxiety. We should have that. St. Paul even speaks of it. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. He says that those who have let go of the opportunity for marriage, they, they should be anxious to please the Lord, to do the work of the Lord. Yeah, I should be. And so that's what I do right now, and I encourage all of you to, um, as well. Don't, don't let go of that burden on your conscience. Keep it. Don't let it keep you up at night, but keep it there. And don't be afraid to cultivate it a little bit. We should be very sensitive to any time we see anybody in need. Because we might not be able to do anything right now for some of us, but eventually those opportunities are going to come along. So you better be willing and able, right? Holy anxiety. And it's really as simple as what that man told uh, Car Cardinal Bergoglio uh, once, once he was elected pope. Don't forget the poor. It's as simple as that. Don't forget the poor. St. Martin de Porres was willing and able to do this work. And I'm sure he didn't just do corporal works of mercy. He also did spiritual works. He brought the gospel. You know, it wasn't an either or. So let's pray tonight that we may receive the grace to do both in our lives.